Hello all. In today's video, I'm going to demonstrate another new board running PyDOS. This time, it's not a microcontroller board, though. The Raspberry Pi Foundation has sold something like 40 million single board computers like these, most of which end up running some version of Linux. But today, we'll see the CircuitPython version of PyDOS run on a Raspberry Pi without Linux or any other operating system. For the last several months, Scott Shawcroft has been leading an effort to port CircuitPython to the Raspberry Pi single board computer. The idea is that Raspberry Pi will run CircuitPython on bare metal or directly on the hardware with no operating system. Now you might wonder why would you want to do this? After all, with a little porting work, you could probably run most CircuitPython programs using Adafruit Splinka on the Raspberry Pi hardware anyway. However, the difference is when running on the bare metal hardware, your programs are running on a true CircuitPython and the Linux and Blinka layers are removed, leaving a much simpler system to set up and maintain. This simpler configuration should be more stable, efficient, and secure. Like most microcontroller boards, the Raspberry Pi has exposed GPIO pins, can be powered over USB, comes in a small form factor, and is relatively inexpensive. In fact, this Raspberry Pi 02W at $15 is less expensive than many of the microcontroller boards I've demonstrated in this series. As you would expect, there are a number of advantages to using a single board computer over a microcontroller board. Some of these include a processor that is many times faster, more memory, and a range of built-in peripherals, like HDMI video, an SD card reader, US, multiple USB ports, and Wi-Fi. Currently, only a small number of the peripherals are supported, but the plans are to include support for most of the hardware. The Raspberry Pi does not have onboard flash storage, so unlike most microcontroller boards, there's no combo button push while power cycling bootloader mode needed to install the CircuitPython image. Instead, building a CircuitPython image file actually builds a boot image that can be written to the standard SD flash card using generic SD imaging software like Escher or ImageWriter. The Raspberry Pi will then load the CircuitPython image during the boot process from the SD card when it's powered on. As I've talked about in previous videos, if you want to do anything beyond the most basic commands with PyDOS, you can't really use the pre-built CircuitPython image from circuitpython.org. You must build a custom image with a couple parameter changes to start from a GitHub site. The CircuitPython process is described in detail on Adafruit's website, and I've also demonstrated a slightly outdated build in an earlier video. I'll include links to my GitHub site, the Adafruit Learning Guide, and my earlier video on building CircuitPython in the description below. It turns out that in the current alpha release of CircuitPython, I found a couple additional issues that also needed to be resolved before PyDOS would run well on the Raspberry Pi Zero 2W hardware I'm using. The community development process for CircuitPython allowed me to communicate the issues and either post fixes or get the issues added to the development timeline for future releases. So I expect future releases of CircuitPython will work with PyDOS using the same build process as any other microcontroller board. However, in the meantime, I've gone ahead and posted the binary image I'll be using in today's video to my GitHub site as a binary asset of the PyDOS version 1.03 release. So if you've managed to get your hands on a Pi 02 w and want to try this out, all you need to do is download the flash image and burn it to, the, to an SD card. Your Pi 0 should then boot into CircuitPython, and you can follow the normal procedure for installing PyDOS. By the way, for some unknown reason, as of my making this video, pyshop.us still has the Pi 0 2 w in stock. I'll throw a link to that site in the description below as well. I'm always surprised when one of you actually watches the video of me building Jeff's terminal kit, as the video is just me babbling away while demonstrating barely adequate soldering techniques. Presumably it's the terminal kit that interests people, so today I've decided to set the camera up to demonstrate PyDOS using the terminal rather than connecting over the serial USB and capturing a putty terminal window as I usually do. Speaking of the serial USB connection, one of the CircuitPython issues being worked on is that when connecting to the Raspberry Pi over the serial USB port, CircuitPython will hang at seemingly random times. I've done a little stress testing, and in my test, CircuitPython has run from between two and eight hours before freezing. Given those run times, if you wanted to play around with the alpha version, you'd be fine using the serial USB connector. If you do plan to connect to the Raspberry Pi over the serial USB port, be sure you use the second port from the edge, as the port on the outer edge can only be used to power the board. The second port can be used to communicate with the board and power it at the same time. I'm going to use hookup wires to connect VCC ground, RX, and TX lines from Jeff's terminal kit to pins 2, 6, 8, and 10 on the Pi's GPIO header. The VCC I'm using on the terminal kit is the one on the 5 volt power connector, not the serial port, because the serial port's VCC is 3.3 volts, not the 5 volts that should be supplied to a Pi. Although I did run the Pi off the 3 volt UART pin before I realized it wasn't 5 volts, and it seemed to work fine. 
Once PyDOS boots up, you can see that we have 32 megabytes of available RAM, way more than any of the microcontroller boards I've tested so far. The Raspberry Pi 2W actually has 512 megabytes of RAM, but the logic necessary to determine the size of available memory on a Raspberry Pi hasn't been completed yet, so the size has just been hard-coded to 32 meg. If I switch my monitor from VGA to HDMI input, you can see one of the benefits of this hardware right away. These are the default settings, which obviously don't fully utilize the display's real estate. I can use the PyDOS screen parameter environment variables, underscore screen width and underscore screen height to tell PyDOS to work with the smaller screen real estate. I created a batch file to set these variables so I don't have to keep typing them in. But recently, a question about configuring the HDMI display was asked on Adafruit's Discord, and Scott explained how to reinitialize the HDMI output while updating settings. This is a simple Python program I wrote, which sets the resolution to 1024 by 480, which, if I run, as you can see, works much better for this screen. I'm going to go ahead and start up Adventure in Pi Basic. I normally speed up my videos by 25% because I think it but during this demo, I'm going to keep the video running at normal speed so you can get a feel for just how fast things run on the Pi Zero hardware. As you can see, we've loaded much faster than we ever did on any of the microcontrollers. And the game doesn't feel like there's much lag at all. But we can actually go one step further. Since there's so much RAM available on this hardware, there's no reason to use my memory-optimized version of Pi Basic. And the original version, only modified with one or two minor changes for running on CircuitPython and PyDOS, can be used. I've posted the slightly modified version of Rich's Pi Basic as a branch on my fork of Pi Basic. I'll include that link as well in the description below. I'm not just going to start Rich's version of PyBasic now. It uses some libraries with the same name as Rich's version. I'll need to declare them out of memory first. I could simply exit PyDOS and perform a Control D soft boot to get a clean instance of PyDOS running. But as I demonstrated in my last video, I can use the functionality of the CircuitPython load next code file command to do the same thing more seamlessly by using the run VM pr Python program. This program will set the next program to load on soft boot to whatever I pass it, launch the program, and then on completion, relaunch the default code file, which will restart PyDOS. This time, Adventure loads even faster and still performs with virtually no lag. As I've mentioned in other videos, this version of Adventure has a much more sophisticated command interpreter, which takes a fair bit more processing power, but is no problem for the Raspberry Pi hardware. This, of course, means you can use and string multiple commands separated by commas on a single line. One side effect of launching programs using the RunVM program is that if you had set any PyDOS environment variables, they're lost when you return to PyDOS. They actually do get passed to the called program environment. They just don't make it back to the new PyDOS session. So as you can see now, my screen parameters have returned to the settings for the VGA display. One last thing I'll show you is connecting an I2C LCD display up using the Raspberry's GPIO pins. This particular LCD requires 5 volts of power, so I'll connect that to the Raspberry second dipole at pin 4. SDA and SCL are on pins 3 and 5, and I can use the ground from pin 9. Once we're connected, we can now scan the I2C bus to see if the LCD display is detected. And there it is. We can also use the LCD print or LCD scroll programs included with PyDOS. CircuitPython still has a way to go before the port on this hardware is ready for prime time, but it does open up some interesting possibilities for embedded systems. I think this could be very useful in systems that need lightweight, low power, and low cost control systems, but require more processing power than typical microcontrollers can provide. Things like flight control, robotic balancing, or vision processing are a few applications that come to mind. Well, that'll do it for this time. As always, thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.